In this video, I'm going to be taking a look at this 1999 prototype Norton Nemesis V8. It's been on display in the National Motorcycle Museum for many years, so we took it out of the museum, brought it down to my workshop, and then strip it all down, try and rectify a few faults, put it back together again, and get it running just perfect, all being well. I did some initial investigations for Series 12 of the Motorbike Show, getting the engine running and getting the bike riding, and Henry rode it briefly for a short distance. But it didn't run that great. It leaked a bit of oil and leaked, leaked a lot of coolant all over the road. So basically now I'm going to start stripping the bike down properly, sorting out all the issues. So I thought I'd start with the front end, do the forks and brakes first. The first thing I noticed was you can't remove the front wheel without first removing the front forks from the bike due to the design. The top and bottom yokes are split in half so you can remove the forks easily from the bike. And here we can see the two parts of the top yoke sliding together. With the bike supported on various bike stands, the forks can be gently levered out of the bike, complete with a braking system, front mud guard, yokes and wheel and discs, all in one piece. I lay the front end assembly on the ground and have a quick look at it, see if I can work out how to get the wheel out. You can't lift the wheel up because it hits the top of the cast mud guard, which is cast into the yokes, the yokes and the fork leg itself. You can't drop the wheel down because the inside part of the disc hits the inside part of the caliper. So the first thing I need to do, I think, is take the spindle out. There's one very large castellated nut holding a steel tube going through some bearings. So first of all, I loosen the two cap head screws with an Allen key to remove the little locking devices. I then had to make a special adapter to undo the castle nut itself. So this is a bit of old scrap steel I had, as well as a socket in the centre and four protruding lugs that line up with the slots. And I can use my ratchet to undo the nut. This is very tight. With the castellated nut removed, I then remove the washer, placing both in a tin for safekeeping. With the castellated nut loosened, the forks now move independent of each other, along with the mud guard and brake caliper. I now have to remove the six cap head bolts that bolt the disc to the wheel. With all the bolts removed, the disc is now free or free from the wheel, so I can lift off the fork, or half the mud guard, one brake caliper, and the disc as one whole assembly. The disc can now be lifted up out of the actual caliper itself and removed from the fork leg. I then removed the second castellated nut and pulled out the central spindle. This is a massive hollow tube. With the spindle removed, you can see the wheel bearings. These are very large diameter outside and very large ball bearings with small balls. They were quite stiff and I had to clean them off and put fresh grease in, but they're in good condition and okay to go again. So now I can turn the fork over and do the other side, first loosening off the cap head bolts that hold the disc to the wheel. There we go, that's the last cap head bolt removed. So now I can lift the fork leg complete with half a mud guard, the brake caliper away and get the disc out and reveal the wheel on its own. So now if I wanted to, I could actually change the tire. I'm now going to remove the independent hydraulic hoses, one to each side of the fork leg. I later found internal drillings in the fork legs that allowed you to use one pipe to feed both calipers. This was, this was discontinued at some point, probably it didn't work, it must have leaked across the joint by the mud guard. But I'll show you that later on in the video. So now I can remove the brake pads themselves. These are held in place by one pin and a clip. The location pin was a bit fiddly to remove, but it came out eventually and then the pads could be lifted away with some pliers.
With the pads removed, I noticed a bit of epoxy resin covering over some sort of bleed hole in the caliper casting. We'll have a look at that later. But for now, let's get the pistons out. They seem to be stuck. I used a suitable lever to undo the outside screws in the caliper body. These screw in with O-rings to make the seal and allow the pistons to be removed from the outside. A gentle push with an Allen key and they pop straight out. That's a big relief. I, was, I thought they might be stuck really tight, but the actual fact they were quite loose. The anodized aluminium pistons seem in fair condition with no, no corrosion or scratches, so that's quite nice. They'll clean up lovely. With all the brake pistons removed, the next thing I'm going to do is pull out the fork sliders. There's a single bolt at the bottom holding them in place and they slide out nicely and I can get the seals away and the bearings. I want to measure the seals and get orders for new ones if I can before I rebuild the front end. Close inspection of the bearings revealing barely anywhere at all and the seals are nice and supple but I'm going to replace them. I found some markings on them and I rang up a company online and they've got them in stock for £6 each delivered next day. So that is really, really good. So now I'll get back to this aerodite problem and wonder why it's there. I use my flat blade screwdriver and, and hammer to tap away at the epoxy resin until it chips off nicely. These are special screwdrivers that are designed to be hammered on the end. The steel shaft goes right through and they're just perfect for this sort of thing. You can gently chisel it away without damaging the aluminium. With most of the epoxy resin removed, I use a smaller screwdriver to tap down in the hole, revealing a grub screw. After a bit of trial and error, I find the right size Allen key that fits the grub screw and it unscrews nicely. With the grub screw removed, I can now finish cleaning up the surface, scraping off the last little bits of epoxy resin. It's quite stuck hard, but it does come off eventually. And then I finish off with a fine file just to make it look nice. I'm looking at the casting and I realise this, this whole lump here was filed off of this side of the brake caliper to miss the wheel lugs on the wheel. And when I trial fitted the wheel back on, they only just miss. I noticed two bolts at the top of the fork leg with a copper washer on underneath the heads of them. So I took the bolts out and put a long piece of welding wire and it goes right down the fork, le fork leg whole length of the leg itself into the caliper and here you can see it protruding through. So this must have been a feed to each brake caliper to operate the brakes from one pipe coming down from the main master cylinder, which is a good idea in theory, but very hard to make work in practice, especially with all the joints and seals. I now spend a bit of time cleaning all the parts up ready for reassembly, giving the castings a gentle wire brush with little stainless steel wire brushes. These make a nice original finish. The main spindle cleaned up nice. I put that in my lathe and give that a rub down with some very fine emery. And all the parts of the brake calipers and nuts and bolts and washers, all the castellated nuts, all cleaned up just perfect. But I hear, hear some noise in the kitchen, so I go down a quick look. Tracy's making a cake. I wonder what cake she's making today. I look in the pan, it's a boiled fruit cake with cherries. This is going to be so nice. I haven't had one of these for ages. So here's the recipe. You can do a freeze frame if you want to see it. So basically, you boil all the ingredients up in the pan first. Then you pour it into the mixing bowl with the powders and all the other bits and pieces that need to be added to the cake to make it really nice and give it a good stir up with a plastic spoon. After a few minutes of stirring and wriggling with a plastic spoon, it's just perfect consistency to be poured into the baking case. Case. Quick tap to make sure it's done nice and then it goes straight into the oven for a little while. And when it comes out, it's just perfect. It smells absolutely amazing. And she does a little poke with a spiky thing again. I think this is an old spoke. I, did, I am missing one in the garage, but I never say anything to her about it. She's quite happy to use it, really. Then cuts it open, have a quick look inside, and it looks lovely. Charlie Reaver's really excited. He had to have a little tipple, and he went bright red in the face.
Okay, she's so used to me pinching the first bit of cake, so she actually cut me a bit this time to take out into the garage. It was really nice and warm straight from the oven. So now I'll get back on with the forks. With all the parts cleaned, ready for assembly, I can now start putting the front forks to put back together. So I slide the stanchion into the lower, lower sliders very carefully, lining up the hole at the bottom and then put in the screw. The screw is, goes into the Allen key first, which allows it to go up through the hole in the bottom of the fork leg, it, through another hole in the bottom of the fork leg, and then engage the thread and turn. You have to turn it quite a lot to make it engage. Once it's engaged, you can do it up nice and tight. And that holds the whole front end assembly together. The hole for the wheel spindle is so big it allows me to get the allen key in through it and tighten the bolt up really tight. With the lower cap head screw tightened really tight, I can now slide the bearing back down the fork stanchion and engage it with the slider. It's a nice sliding fit, so I just tap it into place with a little bit of rod. You can tell when it's at the bottom of the slot because the noise changes from a dull thud to a tap. So now I can slide on the new fork seals. These slide down nicely with nice firm sliding action, which is really good, and press nicely into the lower stanchion held in place with a wire clip. With one side of the forks assembled, complete with caliper, I now have to bleed the brake independently of the other side to make sure I can get all the air out of by wriggling it around to get the air out. So I rig up a master cylinder onto an old pair of handlebars and device, connect it up to the brake caliper, and I can bleed the system wriggling the fork leg around until all the air is out. And once I've done this, I can do the other side as well before fitting it back into the bike as a completely bled assembly. With the left hand brake bled, I can now fit the spindle back into the fork leg with the castellated nut on one side only. Spin it down to the end of its thread. Then push it home and then I can lay the fork down onto the bench so I can next fit the disc brake. The disc brake has to be fitted before the wheel. You can't fit the disc brake onto the wheel first otherwise it won't fit. So I offer up the disc to the caliper, sliding the pads apart so it just slides in nicely. I fitted a new front tyre, so before I fitted the wheel back in the bike I balanced it on my balancing rig adding the lead weights to the light side. It only took five grams to get it true, so that's really good. I'm really pleased with that. So now I can pick the wheel up and put it back into the fork leg, sliding it down over the spindle and engaging it with the actual disc brake rotor itself lining up the holes. Then you have to work from underneath to put the bolts in. I loosely fitted the cap head bolts for now because I'll be removing them to put some thread locker on once I've fitted the whole disc assembly on both sides of the wheel. I can now lift on the right hand fork, fork assembly with completely half mug guard and disc brake until it lines up with the lugs on the wheel. I put in one screw finger tight to hold it in place while I secure the others first with thread locker. Then I can go back and replace the screws on the other side with thread locker. Then we'll all be tight ready for use. I'm using non-permanent medium strength thread locker so I can get the discs off again in the future. The wheel rotates nicely to reveal the rest of the bolts that are hidden by the mudguard.
With all the discs securing bolts fitted, I go around in turn, tightening them up evenly until they're all tight. I can now fit the spindle washer and castellated nut. I do this up hand tight for now, but I can't tighten it up until the bike forks go back into the bike to ensure the fork legs are in line with each other. So now with that done up hand tight, I can turn the forks over and put the thread locker on the other disc. It's quite tricky to manoeuvre and it's had quite a weight really for a front end, but I get it over eventually, being very careful not to scratch any of the aluminium parts. Lay it back on the bench and now I can tighten up the disc bolts on this side. With the disc bolts removed and replaced with thread locker, I can now bleed the front brake. There's a complete assembly with both sides connected up to my master cylinder. There's barely any air in the system now due to the fact that I bled them singularly. So I just top it up, bleed it and put the cap on and that can stay together now until it goes back on the bike. There's a complete assembly, all bled. After a few pumps of the lever, I got a really nice feel, nice and firm and all the bubbles stopped coming up through the hole in the bottom of the plastic container. So now that's all good to go. So I just give it a little check. I can roll the wheel, put the brake on, and it stops rigidly, which is really good. So I'm really pleased with that. So that's basically the front end done. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'm really looking forward to getting the V8 engine out of the bike and all stripped down so I can see what's wrong inside and hopefully rectify the faults. When I was stripping the forks out of the bike at Henry's farm, this little Robin came up and watched me the whole time. He's so tame. And we still get a few hedgehogs every night visiting the garden. <laughs>